Well, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the history and the, the technical part of this, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the ideas behind it, but I'd rather than sort of giving it all away, I'd rather let you all ask me or try to figure out a little bit some of the stuff that's going on, rather than me just sort of, you know, open up the curtain and show you the man behind the curtain in these, these images. Um, so, first off, the foundation of this work is what's called wet plate collodion. It was uh, invented or discovered as a photographic process um, by someone named Frederick Archer in England in 1851. And what collodion is, is that it's cotton that's been soaked in ether. And it turns that the ether dissolves the cotton and it turns into this very syrupy, viscous material. And uh, prior to uh, Frederick Archer, up through the Civil War era, it was used as a band-aid. Um, they discovered that when it's poured on something, it creates a, um, a, a sort of a, a layer of filament on top of the, the, the substance that it's put on. So people get wounded, they pour the clothing on, it dries, and it creates a, a barrier, so you protect it. But uh, in the 1850s, this was the onset of photography. Um, so photography has been sort of more or less 1839. Um, so it only been around 11 years when Archer discovered this, but people were trying all kinds of things to see what they could do to make photographs. So Archer thought, if I suspend light-sensitive materials in collodion, which adheres to surfaces, I can put it on stuff and make photographs. So that's what he did. And so the, the process, you can do different things with this, this collodion material. When you put it on glass, it's called an ambrotype, um, which goes back to Greek for um, permanent image. So this, in theory, lasts forever. Um, so in a little bit after that, um, it was people realized you could put this on other stuff. So um, people began to realize that they could apply it to metal. So taking uh, um, iron plates and pouring it onto that, um, and those are called tintypes. So some of you all may have, you may have seen, you may have photographs of your grandparents, little black pieces of metal that have photographs on. Those are tintypes. So the ambrotype, uh, as I said, sort of was, was um, in use from Frederick Archer um, up to the turn of the century, the mention of the gelatin dry plate. Uh, um, so that sort of took this process out. However, tintypes continued to be made up through the like, 1920s or so, mostly sort of as an amusement. People would go to Coney Island or fairs, things, you can go to um, get little tintypes made. Um, but by and large, uh, this process ended in the um, 1880s development of, of dry plate. So um, now, sir, some of you also. <laughs> so now I can finish my thank yous. So I was going to thank Jennifer and Louisa. Um, as you'll see as I talk, start talking about this further, um, uh, particularly with Louisa for her inspiration, sort of all this stuff, and collaboration in some cases um, uh, with this process. So um, thank you to you two. And your patience. <laughs> so let's see, where was it? Um, so this this process um, for, for um, in the 1854, a little bit after Frederick Archer invented this, a Scottish photographer named Yuri realized that if you took a piece of um, this ambrotype, that traditionally what Archer had done and other people had done is putting it behind a piece of black material. I'm sorry, a piece of black material behind it, and it flips it, it reverses it. So that the silver is what you see is all that's left, and that becomes the positive part of the image. And then the black part disappears and becomes the negative. So it flips it from a negative to a positive process. Well, what Yuri discovered was making what are called here called relievo ambrotypes. So relievo meaning relief, that it sort of gives some depth and dimension to it, ambrotypes. So what Yuri did, and they weren't they're very rare. You look around antique shops and places, you can occasionally see them. But what, what Yuri discovered you could do is put an image behind that ambrotype. So photographing someone with a black background behind them, or taking the actual ambrotype, the clothing, and scraping away the clothing with a knife and putting an image behind it. So it's sort of interesting as, a, as thinking about photography as this um, a tool of authority and, and uh, honesty that all the way back in 1850s people were intentionally manipulated to create these fictive worlds. So someone might be standing in a studio in Mississippi, but then they would have a, a painting of Niagara Falls and insert that person into it. So creating this false reality of a person being someplace that they weren't. So that's sort of the, the foundation behind what's, what's going on or the, the, what a relievable amortype is. So a little bit more about the, the technical part of this. I don't want to get too deep into it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but as I mentioned, thanks to Jason, that they are this size. Part of this process, that these are all unique in the truest sense of the word. There's only one of them. They're one of one. And that each of these pieces of glass 
were actually in the camera, placed into the camera. They're, they're non-reproducible. So that if you have a 8x10 camera, which some standards is a huge camera, but then you're limited to that size of an image. So again, with Jason's help, um, we made a large camera um, that is the, the back of the plate is 14 by 17 inches, and it's about a four foot long camera, big, huge camera. Um, so in the process of making them, that you, you're working with this big camera that changes everything. You start working with that focusing. You have a depth of field of about half an inch. So as you focus, it takes a long time to sort of figure out where you want the focus to be in placing it, and it becomes a more organic process. Um, so it's, it's, that's part of the, the complications, and, and what I love about this process is that it, it's, very, um, it's a, it's a one-of-a-kind object on, on a piece of glass. Um, I think I'll stop there with the technical part. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions in a moment, sort of about the um, other chemistry that's involved, what's all. Actually, I will sort of tell you one quick thing about it, because I think it's fascinating with this. That when you have these plates, the collodion, you pour the collodion onto the glass plate. That part is fairly straightforward. You coat it, called flowing the plate. You pour it on there, you easily coat it, roll it around, and then you put it into silver nitrate, which makes it light sensitive. That part's fairly straightforward. You take it out of there, you put it into the, a foam holder or a plate holder, put it in the back of the camera, make the exposure, take it back into the dark room, and then the tricky part is developing. Those of you guys that have been in a dark room before, you put a piece of photo paper in the tray, you rock it back and forth for a minute and a half, you have time to like talk to people, and you watch things slowly come around. Well, with this process, you have 10 seconds to get that developer evenly flowed onto that piece of glass. So imagine having a 14 by 17 piece of glass, dumping developer on it, getting it all rolled around on the glass and dumped off in 10 seconds. It's hard. That's the hardest part of the process, but that's also sort of the beauty of it. Any place the developer sort of pools or makes little eddies or swirls in it, you get weird sort of anomalies happening in the imagery. So that's part of what I love about it, is it brings all that stuff back. All the sort of the perfection of digital photography is gone with, with this process.